Hello, welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. I'm Louise Palenker. You know, in Media Path, we try to get you obsessed with something other than food and shopping, personal problems, things Indeed. like TVs and books and films, even live humans. And you're going to meet two really lovely ones in just a second. Wheezy, what are you bringing to the table this week? So I read a book this week called Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. And it was written in 2015, which is interesting. So this is even, even before the T word. Uh, this is written in 2015. The book is a letter to his 15-year-old son, which enlightens all of us to our nation's conceptual fabric woven around race and class and our assumed place within that cloth. He sees race as a falsehood and speaks often about people who believe they are white inhabiting what he calls a dream, which can only exist while they are stepping on the backs and necks of those they imagine to be a different color. Uh, I heard it said uh, this week that if there has never been a Supreme Court case argued to defend your rights, then you are privileged. It's important that people of privilege read That's or hear the words line. of those who struggle. And that is a step towards unity and understanding. So the book is, I would call it provocative. There are some elements in the book that, that where you will stop and reread it because it's kind of shocking. But we don't know what it feels like to grow up in a skin of a different color. We sort of walk through the world without being fearful. He talks about 30% uh, of his brain being devoted to fear 24 seven, and <laughs> as it has been his entire life. And I just think it's important for us white people uh, to read and to try to gain a better understanding of what uh, daily life is like for people of color. In the most recent Vanity Fair, it's got Brianna Taylor on the front, and he wrote like five articles. They just oh. turned the magazine over to him, and it's really well written. It's beautiful. He's a beautiful writer. All right. Well, my first book is called Make Russia Great Again. <laughs> it's by Christopher Buckley. Uh, now, the name Buckley obviously is a writing pedigree. He's the son of conservative icon William F. Buckley, but they ain't the same cat. One of the funniest writers currently working. This is a novel. It's fiction but it is dead on. Herb Nutterman is the fictional lead in this book. Herb never intended to become the chief of staff for President Donald J. Trump. But he worked for the Trump Organization for 27 years. He had jobs like the food and beverage manager at the Trump Magnifica Hotel. <laughs> he was the first general manager at Trump Bloody Run Golf Course. <laughs> He backs into the job as White House Chief of Staff, and insanity in the White House ensues. Reviewers called it outrageous and outlandish and deadly accurate. This guy is very funny and snarky. You love it. They changed some of the names. Mike Pence is called Mike Pants. <laughs> That's worth the price of the book. Anyway, Buckley's other <laughs> books are Thank You for Smoking, which was made into a movie. It's run a million times on cable. The Way to Treat a First Lady and Boom's Day. And I have a documentary you and I are going to talk about. It's called Desert One. It's by Barbara Koppel. I, I love anything she does because she won an Oscar back in the 70s for a documentary called Harlan County, USA, which was astonishing, a riveting story of a coal strike in Kentucky. And it harkens back to another coal strike in the 30s. It's sad and it's violent and it's heartbreaking, but it is the single greatest study of what would later become the Trump base. And I'm not saying that judgmentally. I'm just talking about people that had the problems that Trump was able to uh, attack when he ran for president the first time. Now, her new documentary is Desert One. Weezy, you yeah. saw this too. Yes. It's about the ill-fated rescue attempt of the 52 hostages being held at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran during the Carter administration. It's a timeline. They have great animation to sort of walk you through the various points. The best part of the film, though, for me, is the history it lays out about our relationship with Iran. We had a relationship with the Shah of Iran for years. He was a U.S. puppet. He was cruel and violent. And finally, it led to the student revolution, the rise of the new leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, who was uh, the antichrist to us back when he was alive, all leading up to the taking of 52 American hostages and the hostage taking 
uh, was intended to get them to return the Shah to the country, and we didn't. He was here for cancer therapy. We wouldn't give him back, and so they kept him hostages for 500 days or whatever it was, and the rescue mission failed, and the rest is history. But it's really a, a great primer on Iran for those who might be a little young to understand why we don't like them now uh, and where it started. Please. When you watch the film, you're kind of wondering, because in retrospect, you're sort of wondering, okay, so we held on to this guy. They simply wanted to try. It, you put you put the shoe on the other foot and you're saying, if you guys had our criminal, why wouldn't you extradite him? So they felt like we had their criminal. They simply wanted to extradite him. And so for an entire term, for, for Carter's four years in office, they held all of our people, which were just regular people that worked at an embassy in Iran, they held all of our people and we weren't willing to, I know you don't negotiate with host, with, with uh, terrorists and all that, but we weren't willing to give them a guy who was dying anyway to get our folks back. Is there Was there pressure, since he was an American puppet, was there some sort of industrial pressure on Carter not to conciliate? I'm wondering. That was rumored anyway, just before Reagan won, hold off on the release of the hostages and it'll be a big victory for Reagan coming in. And, well, no, that's a know, whole other political side of it. I'm just wondering initially when we had our, when he had their guy, they had our people, we could have given them our, their guy and had our folks back. Yeah. Why yeah. didn't he? That's a great question. I don't know. But it was good. I enjoyed it. She's a great filmmaker. Weezy, uh, we, we, we have to uh, give a, a few minutes to the great loss that we suffered in this country today, RBG. And I think the most incredible thing about the last week is how this woman profoundly affected so many people. To see those uh, masses in front of the Supreme Court was pretty, pretty amazing. Well, I think that when something happens in the news, we can get upset, hair on fire, uh, scream, cry into our pillow. You can do all of that, but then you can also go ahead and get yourself better informed about whatever it is that, that that's going on. And I, I certainly have done that during this current administration. But in the passing of RBG, I think we can all become inspired to learn more about the Supreme Court and what the role that it plays in, in the balance of power. So there's two good books by Jeffrey Tubin. One, the first that I wrote, I believe, about the Supreme Court came out in 2009. It's called The Nine. Uh, in the Nine, uh, acclaimed journalist Jeffrey Tubin takes us into the chambers of the most important and secret legal body in our country, the Supreme Court, revealing the complex dynamic among the nine people who decide the law of the land. And then he wrote, during the Obama administration, he wrote a book called The Oath, insi an insider's account of the momentous ideological war between the John Roberts Supreme Court and the Obama administration. Tubin says both men are young, brilliant, charismatic, charming, determined to change the course of the nation and completely at odds on almost every major constitutional issue. One is radical, one essentially conservative. The surprise is that Obama is the conservative, a believer in incremental change, compromise, and pragmatism over ideology. Roberts and his allies on the court seek to overturn decades of precedent, in short, to undo the ultimate victory FDR achieved in the New Deal. And then there is a book uh, called Supreme Conflict, The Inside Story of the Struggle for Control of the United States Supreme Court by Jan Crawford Greenberg. From the series of Republican nominations that proved deeply frustrating to conservatives, for example, David Souter appointed by G.H.W. Uh, Bush, to the decades of bruising battles that led to the rise of Justices Roberts and Alito, this is the authoritative story of the conservative effort to shift the direction of the high court. The ideological divide being between conservative originalists who believe that the Constitution must be taken as it was originally understood, and those who believe that it is a living, breathing yardstick requiring adjustments and amendments that reflect the time. Just as a tiny example, slavery was legal during the drafting of the Constitution. These originalists are usually Christians who also believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. So may I add that owning people is also an A-OK -okay thing to do in the Bible, as is incest, rape, and homicide. But can we talk about uh, the folks who need a clean and simplistic delineation between good and evil, and folks who are more comfortable grappling and struggling with issues for the sake of a better, more thorough understanding of morality and justice. Do you, do you see like a, a through line there? So those people that are fundamentalist Christians and those people that are originalists, are they the same folks who want to be, who want it to be easy to figure out what to do? Yeah, I think that a lot of uh, Christian fundamentalism is based on 
being able to interpret things in black and white because it's easy for you to make the concessions in your own conscience and teach your children about it. And, uh, but I'll tell you, I'm, I'm really suspect of that because I think a lot of the Christian right sold their souls to support Donald Trump saying he's God's representative here because he's appointing a conservative Supreme Court. So that's a whole other article. What really struck me about this week was uh, uh, the kind of the same thing that happened, not in the same intensity, but when, when, when Kobe died, which was people just gravitate to anybody that is heroic. We're so starved for real heroes. And I think people have just clung to this experience. Uh, e even people, e even people who didn't benefit from all the great works he did for women's rights, uh, men and other citizens and children that are just happy to have the memory of a hero. Well, there are people who are going to vote for Trump who are currently benefiting from the work that RBG did in her lifetime. And, yep. the, and if you're a single issue voter, and here's the last point I'm going to make, if you're a single issue voter, you've got your eyes squarely on that issue and you're ignoring everything else around you that's up in flames. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to look around and not, not just at our own personal interest and to remember that we're part of a human organism. And this COVID virus is definitely an exemplification of that, is that what affects one of us affects all of us. And it's just important to look around you and see how how's everyone doing, not just the people at your church, but everyone in, in the world. How are they doing? Because it's going to ultimately, that's a wave that's going to crash on your shore. Um, and we have to we have to pay attention to each other. And and I think we can do better than than just focusing on one issue. There's life is more complicated. Uh, interestingly or sadly, however you... If you had to ask conservatives what the one issue is, it's Roe Wade and uh, erasing that from the books. And second on the list is uh, uh, the uh, dissolution of Obamacare. But I got to tell you, this may backfire. They're going to force it through and McConnell has the votes and, and, and uh, Trump is salivating, but this could backfire and it could activate uh, the left a little bit more in trying to head off this, what many people think would be a catastrophe with this other appointment at the Supreme Court. But she will be missed. She, it, it was amazing to see people's reaction. It was very touching. All right, I have two of my favorite people on the planet I'm happy to introduce today. They're a couple. They're here to talk about their most recent book, Vegan Recipes for a Healthier Quarantine. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Hang on a second. That's somebody else. Anyway, uh, first, <laughs> ladies first, Wendy Liebman, my friend, a, a nationally famous stand-up comic. In 1996, she was awarded Female Comedian of the Year at the American Comedy Awards. She had a half-hour HBO special in 96, a wonderful Showtime special in 2011, produced by Jeff, her husband, and John Landis, recorded at my favorite theater, the El Portal in North Hollywood. I love it. And the title is worth the, the rental, Taller on TV. <laughs> She's made many appearances on The Tonight Show and David Letterman, married to an extremely talented man, Jeff Sherman. He's a writer, producer, director, composer, a cum laude graduate of Berkeley, way too smart for this show, a UCLA film school graduate. He's written movies like Up the Creek, The Soldier, Revenge of the Nerds 3, written and produced many TV shows like Boy Meets World, Family Rules, Still With Me Kid, The Secret Life of Girls, lots of films and shows for the Disney Channel. And in 2009, co-produced a wonderful documentary about his father and his uncle called The Boys, The Sherman Brothers Story. Jeff is the oldest son of Robert Sherman, and it chronicles the life and the ups and downs and the fights between the famous Sherman Brothers that composed and produced so many of the iconic Disney movie soundtracks with songs like A Spoonful of Sugar Makes the Method Go Down from Mary Poppins. Two lovely folks. Happy to have you here, Wendy and Jeff. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. And I can't believe how smart you both are. I haven't read a book this whole <laughs> pandemic, but I did, I did watch a show that was in uh, Swedish, so I had to read this book. <laughs> but uh, I'm actually reading Judy Gold's book. Yes, you can say that. It's all about um, censorship and comedy. She's and so funny. 
She's well, I think before, before, just to give people a little taste of, of Wendy, who, who, who says she's not smart, all you have to do is watch one minute or one and a half minutes of her stand-up to see the way that she so beautifully and deftly crafts words and understands that the layering and the intersection of words and concept is what just tickles us. And then some guy thought I was Lady Di. He was like pointing to me. He was like, Lady Di? Lady... I was like, me? Like, thank you. I'm not even blonde. Lady Di, wow. Then I found out he was just telling me what to do. <laughs> I was so pissed at my father. I, I, I was just <laughs> pissed. I'm too young to die, you always are. I just turned 32 and I feel so good about that, but I found a gray hair. Yeah, and it was the first one on my chest. And I, <laughs> that's just a joke. <laughs> I'm 33 and I, um, for two years now, and I've been, um, telling that joke for five. I don't feel 33, because I'm 34, so I don't feel... No, I'm 35. That's my final offer. I'm 35, but I don't feel my age. I don't. I feel bloated. I feel all puffy today, you know, because I'm retaining <laughs> a lawyer, because I got... Um... I am puffy, you know what? Because I got my period today. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. And, because most of my friends got it when they were 13, so I was, uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. I, so, I, I was talking to, very, very about Wendy to a friend of mine, and she has this amazing skill, and the only male comic I can compare it to is this really dangerous thing to do, is Stephen Wright, who has the ability to say the most brilliant thing with the fewest possible words. Stephen Wright gave me some advice. I had just gotten The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I'm dating myself. I'm only 50. 35, we saw. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but he said to me, just perform for the people in the studio audience. Don't think about that you're on the, on the TV in front of millions of people. And that really helped me because I just performed the audience. I love Stephen Wright. I think he's a genius. Oh my God. Talk about your first Tonight Show appearance. That's the pivotal time, especially with Carson and any comedian's life. What, what was that like? Well, the whole thing was surreal, as you can probably attest to. I, I once read that uh, Louis Anderson pictured himself, he had an out-of-body experience. He pictured himself watching himself. I didn't have that, but I did feel like the whole experience was surreal because I had only watched him on TV for my whole life. And um, after the show, he and Johnny, Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon came to my dressing room. And I don't remember it, but the people I was with told me about <laughs> it. Um, yeah, and one of my uncles then started talking to me like he was really impressed he had never really paid much attention to me before <laughs> but i want to talk to you a little bit about the word craft because i it's it's so unique your voice is just so special and how, how do you go about do you sometimes just have a joke and then because of your style you could be like well maybe this joke is not finished <laughs> i could add does it does it occur to you that way well, lately, I just listen to what my husband says in his sleep, and I write it all down. <laughs> but for, I have two answers to that, Louise. One is I had a joke for many years. I'm a writer. I write checks. They're mostly fiction. <laughs> and, and, and then it morphed, almost like if you know anything about the Meisner technique. I've done it so many times that it sort of changed itself. And now it's, I'm a writer, I write checks, they're not very good. <laughs> so I would, the little changes happened on stage without me thinking about them. So for example, another example, I wrote a joke uh, a while ago, but I posted it today on Twitter. And the joke is, I dated a musician. He used to play his songs for me on the phone. And then I found out he was just putting me on hold. <laughs> So 
somebody wrote to me and said, do you do that Wendy pause after on, the word on? So then the joke would be, I dated a musician. He used to play his songs for me over the phone. And then I found out he was just putting me on hold. <laughs> there you a go. little different. So I'll take suggestions. No. Uh, well, you tweeted so your Twitter feed is everyone should follow Wendy Liebman on Twitter. You you tweeted something that was so smart, and I I'm going to get it wrong, so maybe you can remember it. It's the one about oh, do we have it here? Yeah, can you oh, read yeah. that one? <laughs> I can never remember which is right brained and which is left brained. So that means that I'm one of those. Yeah, I've told this to Wendy before. Now she's kind of uh, changed up her daily Facebook presentations to these great little minute or so musings and they're hysterical but you used to do this thing that i told you about uh, uh, being a fan of which was just you put the blue background up and in font there was no picture this great one line of profound philosophy and i said why don't you do a line of your own greeting cards because these are hysterical and i guess you tried to do that or it, it didn't happen but i always you loved it the jury's still out on that, speaking of Bruce Bader Ginsburg, whom I loved and mm -hmm. thought she, somebody gave me a figurine of her about a year ago, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Perfect. and it was sent to me wrapped in bubble wrap, and it said, <laughs> keep her safe. Mm -hmm. um, yes, what a loss for our country, and what a beacon of change mm -hmm. and brilliance. Um, I heard she was really tiny. I think Rachel Maddow described her as being like a little hummingbird. Oh. Um, anyway, the jury's still out on my greeting cards. Uh, I'm thinking about doing a book of my jokes. Oh, yeah. I've never published anything. So. They're wonderful. They're little nuggets that you'll just say to a friend at work, and they're it, it, you really have a, a gift for being able to do that without. Thank you so well, much. Well, did did the did the pandemic inspire you to just pick up your phone and talk to it every day to just challenge yourself? You mean at the beginning when I my video updates? Yeah. Honestly, Louise, I feel like it kept me sane. It mm -hmm. made me wake up in the morning. Otherwise, I wouldn't have combed my hair or maybe not even taken a shower. I felt responsible to this little community and then it became fun. What about me? And <laughs> well, you know, I, I have to say I've started talking to myself recently. Well, let me rephrase that. He stopped listening to me in <laughs> April. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have a rhythm, you know, we've been here since March, basically, and we have a rhythm and we kind of pass each other in the hall <laughs> and then eat dinner together. <laughs> but we watched a lot of um, series on TV together. We watched um, Friday Night Lights, oh, it's a big great. one. We, we watched A Place to Call Home. Um, I just finished Call the Midwife, which I love. But anyway, enough about me. Let's talk mm. about- oh, I'm, He'll be happy by the end of this. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I want to ask you guys, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to dredge up painful memories, but the pandemic was just a, 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 one of a long list of obstacles you had to overcome. You had, first of all, you had the Woolsey fire and I visited your home right after that and it burned right up to your property. Um, that awful fire in Ventura County. But before that, you had had a very serious accident. Just briefly without being too painful about it, describe what happened. So I'm looking behind Louise and I'm thinking those are either drums or, oh yes, <laughs> or I, that's what I had. Um, I was thinking those are either drums or nitrous oxide tank, <laughs> which is what I could have used. Those are drums, he's a great drummer, <laughs> that's funny. Because yeah, those are drums, I'm gonna have to put my little RBG on, on one of the drums. Yeah, I mean, she is tiny, so that's, that's Rachel's accurate. <laughs> Actual size. Actual size. <laughs> God. Uh, yes, I do play the drums, and so uh, they, and it turns out they're decorative. Oh. Okay. So yeah. All right. So, so back to this question. Okay. Um, 
in 2018, in November, I was meeting a friend for lunch and I was walking across the street and I was hit by a car. And I ended up breaking one leg and both feet because I'll do anything to get out of having sex. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I got a phone call um, from somebody I didn't know. And it was, uh, it was uh, Ronald Reagan Hospital that day. And they said, uh, uh, you're Wendy Liebman's husband. I said, yes. They said, uh, she is in the hospital and you need to come here right away. And I said, why? And they said, we can't tell you anything. But her trauma name is, and use that. And I didn't have a pencil. So I'm thinking like, maybe they'll never let me in. I get in my car and I'm like, I have no idea what has happened. And I'm driving to UCLA. And I turn on the radio just to calm myself down. And I hear there's a fire coming down. Um, the, it was the Wolsey fire coming down our street. <laughs> the same day, I'm going like, I, I felt like Job driving on the freeway. And I'm going, I, I couldn't believe it. So I wasn't able to, to get back home. I just stayed in the hospital with her while she was there. Because we were, uh, you know, yeah. sent out. So I knew. I knew, I woke up, I passed out. I knew I wasn't at home because I heard a vacuum. <laughs> 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 and um, yeah, they had to put a rod in my leg and then it took many, many months to recover. And I won't go into the details, but it was a long recovery. And then I had to uh, learn to walk again. And then I got to perform twice and then the pandemic hit. But the, the one time that I performed, I headlined at Vitello's, which is our favorite club, right? Mm -hmm. Fritz? Yeah. Um, Fritz knows that I, I produced a comedy show there once a month called Locally Grown Comedy. So it was like my home away from home. So they said my comeback show could be there. And I wanted to thank Jeffrey for taking such good care of me because God only knows he was like a saint. We called him Grub Hubby because he would, bring me, <laughs> he would bring me three meals a day. And I did get a little sick of that bell she would ring. But, uh. <laughs> I mean, he, he was sick one day this pandemic. And I'm like, I can't believe that you didn't go crazy taking but, well, care the, of me. The thing you should know about Wendy, though, is, you know, most people in that position, I mean, she couldn't really even get out of bed. She had a walker and, uh, uh, and uh, it was, it was a, yeah, dead. and they had to re-break your leg. I mean, something was wrong. And so this was like a nine-month to a year recovery process. Yeah, her, her, her. All that comedy business for your year while you're recovering. And then the, the pandemic has sucked up another year's worth of work. So really uh, a huge dent in your life, huh? Well... As Jeff was just going to say, how I, like, I never looked at it as... She, she looked at it as an opportunity, which was a lesson to me. I mean, she really is amazing. I married the right woman, by the way. I mean, it's a lot oh. spiritual in that, not like everything happens for a reason, but okay, this happened, so am I going to complain about it and be depressed about it? No, because... Uh, but ding, 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 can I have another coffee? <laughs> <laughs> So I, wanted, I, am I wanted to thank him. So my idea was to sing um, the Beatles song in my life during my show at Vitello's. Oh. And that, moved, that morphed into me singing three other songs as well. So my whole life, can I swear on this? Oh, oh fuck, fuck yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I thought it, I'm almost 60. I want to sing on stage. I used to sing when I was little on stage in plays, um, but I wanted to sing to him. So I ended up singing four songs in my comedy routine. The first was Help, because <laughs> there's a line that goes, help me get my feet back on the ground. And so I thought that was appropriate. And then I sang In My Life to Jeffrey. And then I sang um, the song Twisted, that Joni Mitchell has covered. Which because is the, I'm twisted. No, no, because I'm twisted. <laughs> no. I had my, the guitar player and accompanist ask me if I had ever been in therapy <laughs> because my jokes <laughs> are woo. Um, and then at the end, 
I and the whole audience sang with a little help from my friends. So wow. that was my last show before the pandemic, and it was one to go out on. So. Oh my goodness. That show was the night before they closed the place down. <laughs> that was it. I, uh, I had one thing, and they were out. I, I, I know you don't even have to describe how devoted Jeffrey is to you because every gig I've ever seen you at, Jeff uh, escorts you and supports you and is there for you. And uh, it's it makes me smile. It's the food. Well, the He's funny thing is I'm food. only coming because you're on the show. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> oh, that's that, funny. Oh. <laughs> Wendy, did, did all that has happened, the accident and the pandemic, skew your comedy at all? Did it give you a different outlook? Did it make you more cynical, less cynical? You know, I think with doing comedy, you and I know that you have to learn other skills, not just being on stage and telling jokes. Like we had to learn to do, or I had to learn to do the radio, to do press. Um, I had to learn how to travel. So now I had to learn how to Zoom and mm. to learn how to do my show from my desk. And I've done about 25 shows now since the pandemic started. And I actually really enjoy it because then I, after the show, I can just go into the kitchen and eat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've done, I haven't done as many as you, but I, I've done a lot of nonprofit fundraisers and I do 10 minutes of, of comedy and it's not perfect. But the truth is, if you're not doing well, nobody knows and you don't know. So it's not an assault on your self-esteem. You just go and on to the I next have my jokes on the screen. So yeah. it's like having a cue card. Right. Wow. Um, so That's so interesting. And so what, what, is, what is the experience for the comic when you don't hear the laughter? Can you see their faces? How do they have, do they have it set up as a as a seminar or how, how, okay. what's your experience? I've done it every way. Okay. I've had it where the audience is completely muted, completely present. The best scenario is to have a few loud laughers and the people who have children and pets and clanging things in the background have them muted. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> There's a great one. I, I was watching oh. one time. <laughs> And they had all the people on the screen and they were none of them were muted. And there was this older couple sitting watching what he with the opening acts, he fell asleep on his chair and you could just see him asleep. And then somebody else said, When are they gonna have Wendy on? These people are horrible. It was it was very funny. <laughs> like they were and, and, the, and the comedian said, I can hear you, you know. <laughs> kind of a different experience. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we're oh, all right. you've written TV shows and movies and stuff. Do you ever get involved in Wendy's writing, or does she solicit your opinion or your editing or anything? I, I accidentally say things that she puts into her act. It's kind of how I contribute. I'll say something, but I've, like, I've helped on a few. Like, what does Marilyn Manson go as on Halloween? He said <laughs> that the other day. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he'll say things all day and I'll write them down. He's so funny. Do you have any couple rules about things that you know you shouldn't joke about or mention from stage? No, although um, I, I've sat with her mother and she makes jokes about Jeffrey. It's sort of like bang, you know. And uh, <laughs> her mother always would like grab my hand and say, I'm so sorry she said that. I've, I've heard it 50 times. That's <laughs> No, I did a joke once about tantric sex, how I, I made you wait six years or something like that. And well, that he was did, a joke? <laughs> and he did not like that. <laughs> but no, I think nothing is off limit. And what I love is that he'll use some of my jokes in his scripts. And I mm. use his jokes on stage. It's like common yeah, we property. Share. Yes. You know. The first time I met Jeff, I took my two sons to see the recording of Boy Meets World on the Disney lot. Right. And he was producing the show. And that was, the, that was the biggest show in my children's life. Yeah, we were excited when you came by. I remember that vividly. It was oh, there great. was a buzz throughout the entire cast. It was crazy. Look, well, Bo great. Boy Meets World is, I, I think it's a cultural touchstone for a lot of people of a certain age. And now that the internet is here, is are there fan groups for it or? There are, there, yes. there's a lot of fans. I mean, I. It's interesting when you, I was there from the beginning of the show, not the pilot, but I came in, I actually wrote the first episode that came on after the pilot. So I was there for the first four and a half years. Um, 
And, uh, you know, when, when it started, uh, there was, you know, you don't know what it is. It's just, it's a show and, and you got your audience there, but you have no idea what the cultural significance is going to be. And when the show started airing, uh, the audience, when the kids came out, the first time after the, um, it aired, the, we introduced the cast at the beginning of the show, and it was like the Beatles were there. And it was, Aww. we all kind of looked, the kids were kind of startled that all these people knew them. And then I went to a, a, that Christmas, the first year, I went to Hawaii and I was wearing my Boy Meets World hat on the beach and I got surrounded. I, you, I had no idea, none of us really did at the time what it would be, but I've been told by a lot of people, like there was, you know, for shows for me were like, you know, Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best and all those kind of things and Happy Days. And a lot of people say it's sort of that, that show that you grow up with. Um, Mr. Feeney was such an important people, a person to so many people's lives. And we, we really did try to do that. We all really cared about it a lot and, and uh, wanted to get a, across some, you know, serious issues too. I, I, I write one really serious episode every year. As long as the first two thirds were funny, they let me do it, so. So what were some of the issues that you, that you got to explore? Well, the first year I did one about uh, Sean, uh, Hunter, the, the main character's best friend, Corey's best friend, blows up a mailbox and he thinks the police are after him. So he hides out and he's gonna run away from home. So they were young and they were like, you know, they were supposed to be like pretty young kids. But I went on to do school vandalism, child abuse. Um, I did uh, about the importance of getting into college was my last episode. I got Eric, who was always sort of the, the fun, I thought he was the funniest guy on the show, but. He was always played sort of as a sort of silly, kind of stupid, weird kid. And we had a debate in the writer's room. Um, I said, my last show on, that I'm going to write, I'd like to get Eric in college. And it, it made this big debate in the room. They said, well, is it essential for people to go to college? And I said, this show is like the number one kid show in the country. Don't you want to tell kids it's good to go to college? And I won the argument and so we were able to do that. Um, and that started the whole- You're Disney Plus now? All yeah, it's on Disney Plus, all of them. Yeah. Episodes, it's probably finding a whole new audience. Yeah, it, 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 I'm sure yeah. it is. I know. mean, I when I say my husband was a producer on Boy Meets World, when I say that on stage, people go, Topanga! They yell out. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of the greatest things in broadcasting history that you named a character Topanga. Yeah, so. and I actually named her. There, there are a lot of stories going around about it, but we were in the room and we decided that she was going to be this, she was supposed to just be on for one episode. We were going to have this hippy dippy girl come on. And so then we said, well, what, should, what would they name her? Moonchild or Starflow <laughs> or, you know. And I said, well, all the, the hippies that I know live in Topanga Canyon, why don't we call her Topanga? <laughs> and a couple of people Perfect. said, that's stupid. And my boss, Michael Jacobs said, oh no, that's what it's going to be. It's and, genius stuck so <laughs> and now there's actually people <laughs> with that name really? god bless you oh i'm <laughs> sure of it there must be it could have you... been school or uh, <laughs> <laughs> well i think on uh i think on mork and mindy they named a character elsinore right oh mm. okay yeah so wendy you started uh stand up in 1984 in boston i just want to talk about that because boston has been the hotbed for some of the most talented guys in the stand-up business. Talk about those days. When, you started. when I first started, it was Lenny Clark, yeah. Barry Crimmins, Steve Sweeney, Jimmy Tingle, and Jonathan Katz. And it was really a hotbed of comedy in that there were at least 15 shows somewhere every night in Boston. And so I had a day job, but then I would change my clothes and go to my night job as long as I was back for the morning to go back to my job, I was okay. I would drive within a hundred mile radius and radius and do like at least one or two gigs. So in that sense, it really like it started a lot of careers. David Cross started there. Um, Laura Keitlinger, if you know her, and Dennis Leary. Dennis Leary was my second paid gig. I was sent to Northampton, Massachusetts to open for him at a little bar and people were playing um, pool and he killed in front of eight people. <laughs> <laughs> 
A funny, funny man. So, and uh, Tony B is still there. It's, it's just a great place for comedy. And even though I'm from New York, which is also a great place for comedy, I never really performed in Manhattan until I got a little older and more uh, used to performing. So, yeah, I took a class on how to be a stand-up comedian, and that's how I started. So, um, I'm sure your picture hangs as the stellar graduate of the course. Oh, I don't know. know. The teacher was Ron Lynch who now has been on the Sarah Silverman program. He's a great character actor and he lives in LA and he runs a oh, show wow. called The Tomorrow Show. Um, but yeah, it was really a special time in Boston in the early 80s. Well, My friends, I want to talk about- uh, were, were unflappable because the audiences are much harder to please on the East Coast than they are out here. I definitely cut my teeth. Like I definitely will do a show now and go, hey, I've done all those other really hard shows, so I can do this. So I yeah. feel like I'm backed up. Um, <laughs> I, ha I, have, I have proven to myself that it's possible. Yeah, I like that. I like that once, once you've accomplished something really difficult, other challenges, you feel like, I can take that. Well, I feel like life is like that now. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Fritz, you feel that way, but once you do stand-up comedy, everything else feels like we're swinging with one bat because stand-up comedy is just an insane thing. Yeah, do. it's nuts. No, it there's, a, there's a certain, I, I mean, it's the same thing as being a meth addict. <laughs> when it's good, it is the, it is the pure, when, when the words are yours and the preparation is yours and nobody knows what you're going to say but you and it works, it's the greatest acclamation you can get but when it goes south it is a dark loneliness that's impossible to describe to other people. That, that never happened to you oh that no no it. certainly not no, but somebody asked me what it was like to bomb recently and i honestly feel like it's the exact same feeling as i felt before i did stand up i felt alone i felt just devastated or embarrassed i felt that's Mis really interesting. Misunderstood. Mm. So really just the things that I felt before I did stand up. I think I, I love that, Wendy, because it 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 what what you're saying is you felt unheard and that's how you felt that's how you were gonna feel your whole life unless you had been bold enough to embark on this and to achieve what you what you have, you were always gonna feel that way. So maybe it made that one night experience more palatable, if you will because that would have been your whole life if you hadn't had courage and now you know you have it. But I, we need to break for commercial, Fritz, and then I really want to talk about The Boys because I'm obsessed with this movie and okay. I have a lot of questions. Winning season returns at MyBookie. Winning season means doubling your first deposit. Winning season means Survivor, Super Contests, and Squares. At MyBookie, it's time to celebrate the NFL season. Sign up now and make your first deposit to get a dollar-for-dollar dollar match all to get a dollar for dollar match all the way up to $1,000 and grab yourself a free entry into the famed MyBookie Super Contest. To play in the contest, all you have to do is pick five NFL games against the spread to have a chance at $100,000 guaranteed in cash prizes. The best part is MyBookie has thousands of bets to choose from, the full NFL slate and the NBA playoffs from live betting to championship futures, every play you want is waiting at my bookie. It's simple. Make your picks, win big, collect your cash. Use promo code THINGS and double your first deposit now. It's a no-brainer. Your winning season begins today only at my bookie. And I have a catchphrase for them, Fritz. I wrote this. You'll love it, we bet. No? Very, very good. Okay. I'll work Can on I the just catchphrase. ask, Wendy, before we leave the bombing thing, and then I want you to go into that movie because I love it. Because when we talked about bombing, it reminded me that my life is a black hole of emotional despair. <laughs> Jerry, tell me if you agree with this or not. I, I love this is like a litmus test for comedians. Jerry Seinfeld said over and over again that if you have a bad show, it's never the audience. It's always you. You agree with that? No. Neither do I. <laughs> I don't agree with it either, and I think there can uh, there can be mitigating factors because there are tons of variables that are involved, and a lot of them can be things like the room size, the way the chairs are are are, are set up, the, the, the tape, the temperature. Uh, if people are allowed to have their backs 
to the stage and eat and just have a conversation. It's so many things are like what's permitted in the room, whether or not music brought you on, uh, the energy, what else was going on that day in the news. I just think there's too many variables and I would like to blame the audience. Thank you. I mean, you don't know when you're going on. You could be following an Elvis impersonator. <laughs> Executive um, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, you, could, you could have sunburned your face except around your eyes. All the, the audience is staring at you. You could have said something unintentional to somebody in the audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, one time. Well, no, I'm not even going to go into it. But yeah. there are so many variables. Yeah, and I agree. He yeah. said some great stuff about comedy that I love, and I, I use them in my own life. He said, writing stand-up comedy is the art of shaving syllables, which is such a perfect description of how it is to write, especially for you, because you try to use the fewest possible words. Huh. My friend Larry Miller has a great description of how hard it is to write stand-up. Larry says, writing stand-up is like operating a still. You put in all the effort, the sweat, the thoughts, you pour it into the funnel, and then maybe days later, if you're lucky, a couple of drops come out. <laughs> I thought that's just brilliant. This is perfect. Oh my Let's God. Let's talk about that great documentary, Wiz. Right. So I when I was a little kid, I, I just have a vivid memory of standing in a in a movie theater lobby and looking at a poster probably for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and I would see those names, Richard Sherman, Robert Sherman. It would say them both. And I, I would think, who are they? How do they do this? And then, so then for you to grow up and make this documentary and answer all my questions, thank you. I'm, I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say one thing before I give, I let him talk the whole time? When I first met him, <laughs> and I heard who his father and uncle were, I thought, wait a minute, aren't they British? And wasn't that 150 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, it didn't make any sense. You're mixing them up with the, the Jick Van Dyke's character in Mary yeah. Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I feel like I married music royalty. Or the chimney sweep, yes. <laughs> So, okay, so you grow up and this is your experience of what life is. You just have this dad who goes to Disney and, and writes songs. What was, what was your first awareness of, of what he did? My dad was very, very, very humble. And like, if, if he didn't mention it, he wouldn't have known, he, he would have thought he was a painter or something. He just had no you know, nothing about that. He kept all of his awards that he ended up getting up in his bathroom. Um, he had Oscars and Grammys and gold records. So it was like the most golden room to, to you know, go pee in. Um, but, uh, but he, um, uh, I think that the first experience, thinking about it, we moved to Beverly Hills when dad first got the job. He was, he was still had day jobs prior to that. They were writing songs for Annette Funicello, as we discussed in the documentary. Um, but we, my dad started getting these checks and he drove us all out to, to Beverly Hills, to this corner house on Oakhurst Drive near the Troubadour. And he said, if we lived here, we'd be home now. And it was a total kind of awakening. So I oh, dad must have done okay. And he started taking me to the studio to visit the lot. And on several occasions, Walt Disney was kind of an amazing guy. He knew every employee's name on the lot, and he knew my name from the first time he met me. He never forgot people's names. Wow. So whenever he'd see me, he kind of, you know, scoop down and talk to me and all that. So, and the thing that was impressive to me was he owned Disneyland, and his name was on the door. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. um, but uh, uh, I think probably when it really started happening was when I was first started seeing the movies that they were doing, we would get dad had a 16 millimeter projector and he would bring home a print or we would go to the premieres when I was old enough. And I think the first one that really registered with me was, um, uh, the parent trap, um, mm -hmm. with Haley Mills, uh, where they wrote, let's get together and a bunch of other songs in that. And then yeah, yeah. stone and some of those other ones. But the big impressive thing to me was dad came home one day with this book. He, he wanted to read it to me and my sister, Lori, 
an older sister, and he would read us chapters of Mary Poppins. And he would just tell the story, and it was just fascinating. And he would explain all this magic is going on at the studio, and there are all the sound stages. And he would tell me all this stuff. It just sounded like this incredible thing. So one day, Dad took me to this. He came to school and took me out of school, and he wanted to show me around to all the sets on the studio lot. So he opened one door, and it's the rooftops of London. He opened another one. It's, it's uh, Uncle Albert's you know, tea party on the ceiling thing. I got to see oh, the shoot man. part of that. And, you know, but it's, it's weird for a little kid. I was pretty young. And so we went around to the different things and we came back to the commissary and I loved the tuna sandwiches at the, at the commissary. <laughs> so I was really excited. After all that, that's what I was really excited about. And we walked in and Walt Disney was there with these two guys in suits. And he walked over to me and he said, well, Jeffrey, I understand you took a look at our sets today. What did you think? And I said, they're okay, I guess. <laughs> and he looked at me like this. He went, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. He goes, you come with me. He left his lunch date, took me by the hand. He took me back over to the rooftop of London set, wherever, whatever stage that was on. He turned on the work lights. And I, you know, I, I didn't know. So he said, well, what is it? I said, I just don't think anybody's going to believe this. And he went, I had the greatest artists in the world create these sets and they, they did these things. It looks like it's all that. And I said, yeah, but it's on the ground. So like, <laughs> you can get he looked at me, he laughed a little bit and he came down next to me like this with his fingers. He said, this is what a camera sees. They don't see anything under it or over it. They won't see the lights. They won't see the ground. They'll believe that this is, and that's called, that's called movie magic and you can never tell your friends. Uh -huh. Which I just did. But, wow. But, what was cool was, though, that your, your opinion really mattered to him because yeah. you're the audience. It did. And that was really good. And then the great part was then he walked me back over and my dad was having a scotch. I think he was <laughs> getting fired. So, um, but uh, that was, that was uh, sort of the magic there. What about the story when you went to the Hollywood Bowl? And you were oh, that was a really cool one. We, they had a... Mary Poppins had come out and had won the two Oscars for best song and best score. And, you know, I mean, I, I was a little kid and, uh, you know, we, I, I didn't know much, but we go and we're in a box at the, at the Hollywood Bowl. And after some classical music, they were going to do a little interlude of some of the Sherman Brothers um, songs from Mary Poppins. And it was a full thing. It was just Hollywood Bowl was full. And uh, so they, they, announced my dad and uncle and my dad and uncle stood up and it was the end of the concert after after they played the songs they said the composers are here and i looked around and people were asking for my autograph because i oh was, my you know i was there with my two sisters and my uncle that we were the only ones i have a picture it was in the la times and i have a picture of me sitting there before i knew how famous my dad had become but that was the moment where you realized went, oh, just this is how much they reached I mean, they came just Society. swarming over to us. It was yeah. amazing. So that that did change my my opinion of them a lot. Let me ask you a question about your dad. I, I'm always fascinated by the answer to this question with uh, uh, famous people that have sons and their relationship with their father. Um, did you feel the pressure? For, and, and this is a this is a male child thing. I mean, I had it myself, and my older son had it with me a lot. Uh, did you feel the pressure to sort of overachieve or do something to take yourself out from under the umbrella of your father? And did he facilitate your talents for music and writing? And did he nurture you so that you would become an individual person? I hope he, was, that he was very, again, he was very humble. And he, my uncle was, when you watch the movie, you can kind of see this. My uncle was, my still is, he's still around, he's 92. Um, and just Mr. Show Business kind of, you know, He's never passed a piano without sitting down and playing a medley. You know? <laughs> my dad used to say that in the, in the middle of the night, he'd go down, my uncle would go downstairs, get a glass of water, open the fridge, and when the light hit him, he'd do 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was very shy and, and uh, a Renaissance man. He painted and metal sculpted and gardened. wrote short stories and gardened. He used to teach me roses. And it was, all, it was one, uh, one, little dab of paint on his on his uh on his uh palette was songwriting and uh he, i mean he, he loved it and he was very devoted to it. but what he did with me was um 
I'll tell you a little side story about this. I, I used to write, so I, my grandfather was also a, a pretty big composer. He's a Tin Pan Alley composer named Dallas Sherman. And he wrote for everybody from Bing Crosby and, and uh, Al Jolson. Al Jolson oh, and wow. Wow. Her, wow. Holiday, on and on. He was like one of the big top 10 Tin Pan Alley songwriters. And he had, my dad and uncle, when they wanted to become songwriters, had, were in his shadow. And they, nobody thought that um, they wrote the songs. They all thought that Al had written the songs. So I kind of went through that myself. But I was writing songs. My grandfather used to come on Sundays to give me piano lessons. And, um, and I, that's how I started. And young, I was probably about seven when I started. And um, he, uh, uh, so anyway, I, I've been writing songs from then on. And I was about 17 and I, I had a piano teacher played her a song and she said, this is really wonderful. And she told my dad and he said, yeah, that really is good. And he said, would you wanna try going to a music publisher and see if you can do something with your songs? And I said, sure. So he called up this friend of his at New York Times Music Publishing, which was on, right near Vine Street in Sunset. <laughs> and I went up there and I, I'd had a recording session and, and with some, some of the, actually with the, uh, the Wrecking Crew. Uh, that oh, were friends of my dad's. My favorite playing. movie of all time. I've just seen that about 50 times. I love it so much. And I didn't know at the time that they were playing on my session. And they sound, it sounded much better than it deserved. <laughs> And so I, I go up to the New York Times Music Publishing guy, and I'm sitting as the president of it, and I sit across from him, and he says, well, play me one of your songs. So I played him a little bit, and he goes, that's great. He goes, uh, uh, you, uh, play me another one. I said, well, I've got like six. He goes, I'm only going to listen to one more. I said, okay, <laughs> so this one, and we played it. And he said, okay, I'm going to publish those two songs. So I'm 17 years old. I'm a published oh songwriter, right? So I'm excited about this. And I go home, I tell my dad, he goes, that's great. Well, months went by and I never heard from the guy. I got paperwork, signed it, all that stuff. So I said, dad, what do I do? He hasn't, he said, well, set up another meeting, go back in and find out what's going on. So I do, and I, I go in and this time he's not as nice as he was the first time. And I sit in this chair, it's one of those, it was like out of a movie, I like sunk into this chair where like I, I thought I was gonna get swallowed by it. And he's just staring at me on the phone and then he hangs up and goes, what? And I said, uh, I, well, you, you're publishing two of my songs. I wanted to know what, what happens next. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, what are we going to do with them? He goes, you know, I did that as a favor to your father. And so I, it killed me. And I, I decided I wasn't going to pursue it professionally after that because it just really, it, it was horrible. But honestly, I'm sorry. But I'm not okay, sorry. So, so, but I went back and my dad said, I was afraid of that. He goes, and he told me the story of how, you know, his father, had a shadow over him. He goes, these kind of things you kind of have to do on your own. He goes, but he always supported me. I remember when I was writing scripts in film school, I went to UCLA film school, as you mentioned, and I was a screenwriter mostly there. And I did a couple movies, but, um, and I was typing late at night. I had a deadline for my teacher and I had to, I wrote my first feature script and I turned around and I saw my dad standing in my doorway because I was still living at home with them. And I said, how long have you been there? He goes, a while. I just wanted to watch you work. Oh, wow. I was going to say, oh, I'm sorry. No, Wendy, I want to hear your thing. I'm so sorry. I was going to say, regardless of that stupid publisher at the New York Times. We hate him. We hate him. Um, I think my husband's music is on par with, I think it's the best music. It's my favorite music. As I mentioned, it's very <laughs> Honest, Honestly, he wrote a lot of pandemic music uh or a lot of music during the pandemic and it's my soul like i love this music so much and i want the world to hear it i did want to tell one other story about jeff's music and um the captain and tenille <laughs> so should i tell it or do you want to well my music teacher that i mentioned she heard the song i'd written and she said you know you you should play this for you should send this to my friend. And I said, who's your friend? She goes, Tony Tennille. And I knew that Captain Tennille, they had Love Will Keep Us Together. It was like a big hit on the radio. It was huge at that time. It was, I think it was 17 or something. So I sent them the song and I got a call from her and she said, would you come over to our house? And I met, I met with them at their poolside. It was kind of funny because, you know, he walked out actually in the captain's house. <laughs> and so we're sitting there and she's very nice. And she goes, 
you know, we're, we're looking for a title song for our next album, for our follow-up album to Love Will Keep Us Together. And we really, it was called uh, uh, Remember Me. Remember Me. And uh, so, which I couldn't remember at the moment. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I, uh, um, I said, well, that's great. And, and, and the captain, Daryl, said to me, he goes, by the way, we put our name on the songs with you. Uh, if we do this, um, oh, so just wow. so you know that, and oh, I guess that's okay. But like, you know, I want to ask my dad. And he goes, "Who's your dad?" I told him. He goes, "Okay, go ahead." So I go home, and they wanted to make this. The, I was going to be seventeen with the next Captain Tamil hit. So I was all excited. I come home to my dad, and he's he's sitting there having coffee. And I said, "Dad, Captain Tamil." He goes, "Who?" I said, "Love will keep us together." He goes, "Okay." I said, "But they want to. It's okay. They want to put their name on it with me." He goes, "Tell them to go fuck themselves." <laughs> I said, excuse me? He, I said, Dad, there, he says, I don't care. He said, you know, the, the, the colonel came to me to, to, for Dick and me to write songs for Elvis, but Elvis was going to put his name on him, and I told him to fuck off, so tell the captain and whoever, they can fuck themselves. So you so, just tell the captain and the colonel and the general and whoever else, go stick it. By the way, I always thought that was bad advice because I would have started my music career at 17, but... Uh, you should hear that song. It's well, so beautiful. But, you know, but so it's... So yeah, I, you would have had to split the I, publishing from with three ways instead of just for you. That's what he was complaining about, right? Yeah. Well, he was just... It's just... It's the principle also, but yeah, that yeah. is what goes on. And I, I've interviewed... In my radio career, I've interviewed a lot of artists and then you hear kind of like even stuff that, you know, that they're not saying on, on mic, but you just, you just hear things about people doing that. And that is what, that is what goes on. Yeah. Unfortunately. So I'm, I'm, I'm also therefore responsible for Muskrat Love. Which is what, <laughs> Which they, was, what they, that was their title song. Instead of oh, the, well, wow. <laughs> thank you. I mean, uh, like, you know, no, a that, grateful I world. I got bumped for Muskrat Love. Jeff, let's talk about your That's current project before we run out of time. You're doing a musical about Three Dog Night, which is... What? Yes. Yeah, stage musical. It's not, it's stage has always been my favorite thing. Stage musicals, it's the most magical thing for me to see a live performance of a musical. And, and uh, ever since I saw Man of La Mancha when I was a little boy, my dad took me, and I just always wanted to do it. So on my 60th birthday, a, a guy friended me on Facebook, and he said... I'm looking for a writer. I have a property. And I said, well, I'm a writer. You want to tell me about it? And so he did. And it, it was this wonderful man named Joel Cohen. And Joel was the original road manager for Three Dog Night. He'd been on the road with Steppenwolf and got the job to get uh, to do uh, to ma road manage uh, Three Dog Night. And what he did when he was uh, on the road with them is he started taking notes and he wrote a contemporaneous book about being with this band that went from sleeping in their cars to filling the cotton bowl in a year and a half. And it's that period of time. He went on to become their manager. He discovered Cheech and Chong and they got, they got stolen by Lou Adler. But he also managed uh, Steely Dan. But he said this was the highlight of his life. So he'd written this book. It was one of the first rock and roll books about a band, but it was written kind of for teenagers. It's a little paperback book um, that they used to sell at concerts and record stores. And they sold, he sold 40,000 copies of it. So he said, I want to adapt this into either movie or stage musical. I read it and I said, I think you should do it as a stage musical because I think it's really a cool story and it's a compressed amount of time. So he and I worked on it um, for, we've been working actually for about almost three years now. And we've been working in conjunction with, uh, with uh, Danny Hutton, who was the founding member of the band. And... Uh, one of the highlights, I mean, when I was a kid, I went on a teen tour across America when their songs were all on the radio and we used to sing them. We had a Wurlitzer jukebox in the, in the back house. I had the key to it. They were my singles that I would put in there. I had rows of Three Dog Nights. And so this was like a dream for me. And so um, I uh, developed this out with him and we're now, we've done eight drafts. We just did our second read of it. We did a Zoom read and I'm cutting it together right now for this uh, producer that wants to see it. And in 50 years, um, the band, the guy who started the band, Danny Hutton, hasn't wanted to uh, have, or he didn't like well, anything. Yeah, he said he said to me, we were all working here with, also with Richie Podler and uh, Bill Cooper, who were the huge record producers. They were their producers. We were all sitting around the table and we took a break for lunch. 
And Danny came over to me and said, you know, Jeff, for 50 years, people have been after me to, to do a movie or something on this. And he said, uh, this is the first time I've said, okay, and thank you for cementing my, my legacy. So. Wow. Okay, I so think, did I, meet, did I meet the guy that you're talking about that wrote that book? Wasn't he the stage manager for the hurricane benefit we did? I had yes. a comment. Yes, yeah, yes. Yes. That's Joel. Well, it'll be wonderful. Well, I have a, I have a few questions. Uh, so this may take another hour uh, because I'm also obsessed with Three Dog Night. So you, you've got three individual guys, all three lead singers, but the, all the songs were written by the greatest songwriters of the time. So how are you going to get the rights to this music? Well, technically, uh, most of the catalog is under Universal Music um, and we'll negotiate some kind of a licensing. Thing. Well, I've had a little experience with, with uh, uh, licensing because... Uh, when we did the boys, we had to clear 160 songs. And you think, well, they're my dad and uncle's wow. songs, and my grandfather's songs, and that'll be easy. It, it was not. It's not. A lot of them were Disney songs, but a lot mm -hmm. of them were not. They were before and after and for different studios. And when you when you'll you'll you find when you're clearing these things that people have sort of a grudge against Disney and they go, if this is for Disney, we're not gonna give it to you or what so you had to just wow. negotiate everything, they had to change things out and do all that. But we had 160 just an extra year to clear all those songs. So I know how to do it. But and I have, great time. go ahead, Weezy. Go ahead. No, I just have one question that I really wanted to ask you about your dad and your uncle. Because they according to the movie, they really didn't really like each other, but they were sort of connected at the career. Do you think that that had to do with their upbringing? I know there were very different personality types, but do you think that they would have had a better shot at being friends if they hadn't been brothers? Probably. You know, it's interesting when we were interviewing uh, Haley Mills, she had such a profound thing to say, which we didn't put in the film, but she goes, you know, when you're, you know, if you, you've all collaborated, when you collaborate that intensely, and they collaborated for 50 years or more, and sitting in that room and all the battles that go on just creatively and all that stuff um, to be able to do that they needed time away from each other to be able to refresh and, and live their lives but they they're just I mean they're they're so you know I, I'm very friendly with my with my uncle before the pandemic we would have lunch every four months with my cousin and uh, um, and all that they're, it's just sitting with him it's you, you almost wouldn't know they were brothers because my dad was such a different personality type they were yin yang and they needed each other. I mean, somebody yeah. said that in the movie that their conflict was the. Yeah, Jeff Curry said that. Yeah, the conflict created all this. It's fusion. Yeah. And, and it's true with most, you know, if you look at most rock bands, they don't last very long. Even the Beatles, what was that, nine years? Well, I guess year prior to the launch of all their stuff. But it's very hard to, to keep that going. But it's interesting, my dad was mostly the lyricist and often composers would come to him and say, you want to come do a score with me or write a song? And my dad would go, no. And I, uh, you know, and he would come home so angry with my uncle sometimes. And I said to him, dad, why, why do you stay in this relationship if it's, if it's so hard for you? Because it really did beat him up. I mean, it, it, it got very personal and, and tough for them. And he said, I, we write really well together. We just have a, a thing. And I, I did a project when the Disney Channel first started, I, I, I sold a show with the Osmond family and I went into Disney Channel and I said, I wanna do half hour musicals based on children's classics. And they said, okay, and, and what? I said, I'm gonna get the Sherman brothers to write songs for it. And they sat up and they said, what's that gonna cost us? Well, I never asked my dad what he got paid. And I said, well, it's gonna be like, you know, $5,000 a song. And they went, can you sign this right now and do this? And, uh, so I went back and I, I said, Dad, I got us all a job. We're going to get to work together and go out to Provo, Utah to the Osmond Studios. And he goes, great, what are they going to pay? And I said, $5,000 a song. He goes, back in 1952. I think, but, <laughs> but they were cool. And it was, it, was, it was really, that's how I learned to write musicals was as I wrote the scripts, they would write the songs. And then we switched a couple of times. This is a show called The Enchanted Musical Playhouse. With the Osmonds? Yes. Oh, that's so cool. Jimmy and Donnie were my partners and uh, a company called Centerpoint. And, uh, um, but we shot it out there. We used their, their uh, you know, facilities. And Marie was the Velveteen Rabbit in our first episode. <laughs> oh, man. And all, all of them were around there. So it was really great. But the greatest experience of that was 
all aspects of it. You know, I'd gone to film school prior to this, so I knew a little bit about everything with the, you know, mixing and this and that. But I got to watch, I sat with them in an office and we'd, we'd song spot my script. So we'd go through the story and, and they, my uncle would go, no, no, I, I think right here, there's a song right here. And he'd run over to the piano and start playing something. My dad would pull out his pen. So I got to watch how they oh, wove man. the songs into the story. And my dad explained to me, he goes, songs never stop the progress. You either learn something that progresses the plot or, or expands character. And that stayed with uh -huh. me. So now I'm, I'm writing my own musical. Wendy's writing her own musical. Uh, but it's, it's, it was such a great lesson at the feet of these two giants, you know, that I just kind of called dad and uncle. Oh, that's so special. Well, it's hereditary in your family because I always love Wendy has your son Alex open for her shows. He's this talented guitar player and singer, and he's a great start to every evening when you're over there. Listening. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, yeah, I, think I bet he's missing that right now. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's wonderful. And he's about to make me a grandfather. Oh cool. no! Congratulations! Wow. Thank you, little girl. Yeah. Oh. oh wow! Congratulations! I've That's never exciting. changed a diaper in my life. Well, so. give a little time. Just stick with me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll well, you, uh, you guys are uh, uh, so talented, but I, I do want to say one thing. I don't think there's anybody uh, in our business uh, who is loved more than the Shermans, Wendy and Jeff, and uh, you know that by the number of friends you have. I remember you were about halfway through your recovery from the accident. You were nice enough to invite me over to your home. And it was packed wall to wall with loving friends who were praying for her recovery. And, uh, and I think among the comedians, you, you are really one of the most universally loved and appreciated people, Wendy. Just, I haven't worked with Jeff that much, but hopefully you'll hire me for one I think of they came because we, they knew we had a taco truck. Oh. <laughs> I thought you just really wanted a lot of coffee. No. <laughs> I have so much respect for you guys. Happy to know I, you. The taco we, truck is a great trick, though. Totally mutual, and uh, yeah, I think people could say the same about you. And don't I break think, the egg. No, I think people do say the same thing about Fritz. I've yeah. heard it said. Okay. Yes, oh. yes. All right, guys, yes. thank you. you Wendy, close it up. We were doing this, so. So, Wendy, what 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 would you love for people to do? Would you love for them to follow you on Twitter if you had a few requests of folks? Well, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, of course, not Friendster or MySpace anymore. <laughs> but um, I started doing uh, Cameo, which is you can hire me uh, for a minimal price to say happy birthday to a loved one. Or people have just started asking me to talk to them. So it's uh, a it's therapeutic. Yeah. Hello. And the other thing I started doing, I've done two birthday shows now. So I've hired another comedian and we both go into somebody's Zoom party and do a little birthday show. And that's been really fun. So it's just another way to make some income while we're all stuck at home. Your Humans are so innovative. Films are so funny and cute. Do you put those on Instagram and Twitter as well or just on Facebook? Uh, on Facebook and Instagram, oh, okay. not on Twitter because they're too long. I don't, yeah, yeah but uh, I have these minute and a half video updates. I'm up to day 184. They're perfect. Believe it. They're so, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Close it out, Wheezy. I just want to ask uh, Jeffrey if you want us to follow you on social media as well. I'm just on Facebook. Okay. I, I'm not, but I do actually, I post. Uh, once in a while, I'll make little uh, movies and I'll put them on my uh, on YouTube on my Jeffrey Sherman channel, so they can find those too. Just I, I take a lot of photographs, and some of my music she was talking about underscores a lot of it. So, would oh. you workshop the Three Dog Night musical here in town? We will be. Yeah, we were supposed to be doing it uh, last uh, April, but that's uh, that got postponed. So. You know, we're trying to progress it as we can right now. And, uh, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how to do that. So yeah. we'll figure well, it out. I, yeah, it will be done here. Yes. I, eager, I eagerly await that. 
Yeah. All right. Here come the closing credits. I want to, we would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod and on Facebook, where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. I want to thank our guests, Wendy Liebman and Jeff Sherman. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Demanda, Mosey Masenko, John Maddox, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Brian Benna, and you. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path.